Good evening and uh, thank you everyone for attending this meeting today. Can you everybody hear correctly? Good, okay. Okay, uh, city is undertaking water and wastewater servicing and capacity master plan study. Uh, back in October last year, we had our first public information session where we presented the preliminary study findings. Since then, there have been further progress on the study that we are going to present today and seek input, comments, or feedback uh, from you. Let me introduce myself and the team. Uh, my name is uh, Nafi Rahman, uh, Supervisor of Capital Projects with the City of Kawartha Lakes. Uh, I am the project lead on the city side with the help of uh, Juan Ruhas, uh, Director of Engineering and Corporate Assets, uh, Corby Pardi, uh, Manager of Infrastructure Design and Construction, Martin Leclerc, uh, Senior Engineer Tech. Also, we are coordinating closely with the uh, other city department, city planning, uh, development engineering, and also water and wastewater uh, operations group. City hired a consultant uh, team, uh, TY Lin. Uh, Kevin Brown, he is the project manager uh, from TY Lin, also leading this project. So now I, am, now I am passing over to Kevin to introduce his team and provide the presentation. Welcome to the presentation, thank you. All right, thank you, Nafir. Uh, and thank you everybody at home for tuning in. Um, I've got uh, 15, 20 people in front of me here now. I'm gonna try and make sure I make eye contact with everybody, but, uh, but thank you. Um, as Nafir has said, my name is Kevin Brown. I'm a senior municipal engineer with TY Lin. Um, and uh, I also want to recognize Civica, a corporate partner in this, um, and, their, uh, and, and, and acknowledge their role in this, in this study as well. Um, so thank you very much. For those of you in the room, uh, I've got Vardini Parvatham, who's uh, one of my uh, water modelers, and Sydney McIver, who's been helping out with some of the uh, communications and consultation. So thank you very much. All right, on with the presentation. The land acknowledgement. Uh, the city of Kawartha Lakes respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Mississauga lands and the traditional territory covered by Williams treaties. We are grateful for the opportunity to work here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit and other indigenous peoples, both in shaping and strengthening this community and country as a whole. This recognition is connected to our collective commitment to make a promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. All right, so welcome. Uh, we've already done the introductions. Um, for those of you who are uh, remote, um, if you have questions, um, there is a uh, there's a Q and A available to you, so you can type questions in that way. Uh, we will read and respond to questions at the end of the presentation. For those of you here in the room, same idea. Um, I re request that we try and get through the presentation. Um, very likely, if you have a question, there's a good chance I'll be answering it um, in the next the slide or two. Um, now, with respect to uh, with respect to questions, there are we refer to as open doors and closed doors. This is the water and wastewater infrastructure master plan. Um, this is not the planning study. This study is informed by the planning study, but it's got a separate mandate. Um, you know, if you have, you know, concerns about transportation matters or stormwater matters or other things that are not water and wastewater, we will try and direct you to a city staff person who can assist you. They may not be here today, but maybe we'll give you a name, but, you know, we, we can't be expected to respond to elements of the, that are not part of the study. Um, and technical issues, we've had one already. We've resolved it. Let's hope that's all we get. If there are more, if you have a problem at home and your and your service or your signal cuts out, this video is being recorded. Actually, that's one thing I should have mentioned as well. This video is being recorded, uh, but we're not recording um, audio or video from people that are uh, di dialing in remotely. Um, if something happens and you glitch out, the recording of tonight's presentation will be made available on the project website, which is there. Um, at this time, for those of you at home, there's also a QR code in the top right corner. Um, if you've got a smartphone and are able to scan that QR code, it will take you to a registration form where you can type in uh, email address, your name, um, and uh, postal address if you prefer, 
Uh, we will communicate back to you using that information if you so choose. Okay, so the a little recap of the study background. You know, this this project is is driven largely by um, you know the growth forecast that's coming you know between now and 2051. Uh, that growth forecast was identified in the provincial growth plan, which is called a place to grow, uh, and is also reflected in the town's you know ongoing growth management strategy, which is their planning process. Um, City Council recently also adopted the province's housing target for Kawartha Lakes, uh, which was set at 6,500 newly constructed homes uh, by the end of 2031. So ultimately the objective of this master plan is to ensure that the approved and forecasted growth can be serviced without affecting the level of service for existing residents and businesses. And also to make sure that, you know, infrastructure capacities are there before they're needed. You know, um, if there is, uh, you know, interest in, in growing and there is interest in people buying homes, uh, the city doesn't want to be the bottleneck in that process. Uh, a couple of notes about growth and infrastructure plans. So the growth management strategy, that GMS process, is a parallel study of the water wastewater master plan update. Um, I'm going to be presenting some growth forecasts on the next slide. Uh, I just want everybody to be reassured that those are preliminary and they are subject to change. Um, you know, the, the day after, you know, a growth plan or an infrastructure plan is finalized, it's, it's likely out of date because there'll be a new development application that'll come in and it gets considered on its merits. Right? Um, that said, the forecasts aren't, you know, they're, they're important. And, you know, the forecasts that we've got are appropriate for the basis of this water wastewater master plan. Um, and the plans are updated regularly. So as, as growth policy changes, you know, uh, so too will the infrastructure master plans. They they typically get updated on about a five-year cycle. Um, the infrastructure plans, they tend to be slightly conservative. So when we look at anticipated, you know, number of units that are going to be built, uh, we apply engineering design criteria to those that are typically a little bit conservative. So we're going to be identifying, um, you know, flows to treatment plants that may ultimately end up being a little bit higher than what we fully expect them to be. Um, that builds in a little bit of additional capacity in the systems to be able to consider individual applications that maybe weren't part of the formal plan as they pop up, um, you know, and, it, and it, just, it just provides a little bit of a buffer as well. So these numbers, again, they're, they're way more precise than I like them to be. Um, you know, we're going down to the, to the one. Um, that's a function of, you know, anticipated forecast for number of homes multiplied by the, the design standard of 2.3 persons per unit. So we end up getting these, these very precise numbers. Uh, these are these are forecasts. Um, they're not going to, the, these communities are not going to grow exactly to those numbers exactly by 2051. But this is the plan that we have right now, and we're going to work towards it. Also be assured that, you know, because we're saying, you know, Birch Point forecasted growth is zero, doesn't mean that, you know, nobody can build a house in Birch Point. Nobody's allowed to move into Birch Point. No, that's not it. You know, individual applications for developments will be considered on their merits, but we have these overarching growth forecasts that help to guide our infrastructure planning process. Um, in terms of the level of service, again, we have a forecasted growth that's coming. We want to make sure that there's enough water treatment capacity and wastewater treatment capacity. We want to make sure that the water system pressures and fire flows are sufficient. We want to make sure that the sewers have enough capacity. Under dry weather flow conditions, the sewers should flow at less than 100% full. Under wet weather flow conditions, there's rainwater that can find its way into our storm sewer, into our sanitary sewers. We do our best to limit that, but it happens. And under, under high storm events, we will accept that the pipes themselves may be flowing a little bit greater than full. We want to make sure, though, that the water levels in the sewers and in the manholes stay sufficiently below the road grades that they're also below typical basement depths so that there's a uh, a limited risk of basement flooding. Uh, this study is following the environmental assessment process. Um, this is a public process that ensures that if infrastructure if uh, if infrastructure investments are needed, they're done so in a thoughtful way that are uh, sustainable that uh, don't adversely impact you know the environment, the social environment, uh, and and that are financially and technically viable as well. So uh, we're at the second public consultation event. 
uh, we're going to be presenting to you um, our uh, our assessment of what infrastructure upgrades are needed um, at, at a high level still. Um, there is a little bit of refinement that's needed, uh, and we'll get into that as we get into the individual um, individual slides coming later. Again, you know, the master plan is, you know, seeks to identify facility and system upgrades that are needed to support the growth. We're also going to identify the capital planning investments to assist the city in, in financing these upgrades. Uh, and, you know, we're looking to identify or maintain the level of service uh, throughout the communities. Now, as part of every class environmental assessment, there's an evaluation of alternatives. So there are a number of things that we have to look at. You know, we can't just decide that it has to be this way. Uh, the first two are mandated as part of the Class Environmental Assessment Act. We have to look at do nothing. Well, the do nothing alternative is allow the growth to occur, but don't upgrade anything. And, you know, see, you know, and, and you know, cross your fingers and hope nothing breaks. Um, obviously, we can't do that. There's, there's too great a risk to the integrity of the, of the, of the infrastructure and the environment. But the do nothing approach kind of helps us identify what the problem is or what the problem will be. And um, on the on the maps that we're going to be showing uh, coming up in the presentation or that are here in the room, that's effectively what we've shown. We've shown the existing systems, the existing capacities with all of the forecasted growth connected to those systems. You know, we've made some assumptions about where the most likely connection points would be. And we're identifying in red on those maps the locations where there are constraints. Um, so that's effectively the do nothing alternative. You know, we, we can't really allow that. Uh, limit community growth is another one that looks at it. It's kind of the corollary to doing nothing. Limit community growth, what you do is you identify the limiting capacity of infrastructure and you say, well, we're going to grow to that point, but then no more. You know, we don't want to invest anything, uh, but we're going to cap our growth at those, at those limits. Well, that doesn't fulfill the growth management objectives established through places to grow in the growth management strategy. So what about water conservation inflow reduction? If we can convince everybody to use half as much water, we can service twice as many people through the pipes. Um, obviously, there's been lots of advancements in uh, water efficient fixtures over the last you know 20 some odd years. Uh, I can't imagine that there are too many homes um, in Ontario that you know still have uh, that do not have water efficient fixtures now. Obviously, they don't all, but the point is that we've we've gained a lot in terms of water conservation over the last 20 years you're not going to keep recognizing those same gains year over year. Uh, we're, I think we're starting to reach a point where, you know, our ability to conserve more water is, is, is approaching a limit. Um, similarly, for the wastewater systems, I already touched on, you know, stormwater getting into sewer systems. What can we do about that? If we can prevent stormwater from getting into the sewers, it frees up capacity in those sewers for, uh, for more people to connect. Um, you know, and we are, we are seeing some of that. You know, we're in Kawartha Lakes. Right. We are surrounded by lakes and rivers and waterways all over the place. Uh, the sanitary sewers almost everywhere are below lake level or below groundwater level. Uh, as those sewers age and many of the old sewers were built out of concrete, concrete doesn't bend very well. You know, if there are vibrations or settlements or whatever, concrete cracks, the joints separate, infiltration, groundwater can get in. Um, when the city, you know, typically, you know, if the city is aware of areas and, and there are proactive uh, studies that they're doing to identify inflow, but if they know that there's high inflow in a street and the street's up for rehabilitation, they'll replace the old concrete pipes with plastic pipes, which are a little bit more flexible. You can have restrained joints on them. They're generally a little bit more watertight. So that's, that's a step that the city can take as well to help mitigate the effects of inflow. But again, inflow reduction is not going to be the solution to uh, servicing the growth that's forecasted. So, you know, ultimately what it's gonna come down to is expanding facilities and services. Um, so we're identifying the improvements that are required to treatment plants, pumping stations, storage and pipes. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna continue to investigate, you know, water conservation and inflow reduction. You know, there, you know, you can, we can, we can minimize some expenses. There could be some, some cost effective gains made in those areas that, that can help mitigate that. Uh, in some cases, they're not permanent fix, but in some cases, they can be a good short-term fix to allow some development to occur in the interim um, and, and deferring the capital upgrades um, a little bit later. Excuse me. Uh, a couple of things that I want to touch on as well. So as part of this master's, master plan class environmental assessment, when it comes to treatment upgrades, and you're going to see that treatment upgrades are being 
identified. Um, this study is only identifying that a, an increase of the treatment capacity is needed, whether it's the water treatment plants or the wastewater treatment plants. Um, this study is not in-depth enough to be able to de determine exactly how best to provide that additional treatment capacity. Um, it could be a plant expansion. It could be, maybe it's going to be put in a second plant to help you know, uh, treat some of the flows. Maybe it's mothball the existing one and build a new one. Um, some plants have got limited site capacity, um, so you can't really expand them, but there are more efficient processes available today than there may have been when some of these plants were built. So you can replace some of the processes with more efficient processes. Again, that's beyond my level of expertise. It's beyond the scope of this study, um, and it requires a much more stringent class environmental assessment process. Um, with storage and pumping stations, we've identified a number of locations where based on what we're assuming about where the new development is going to connect and which way it's going to flow, we've identified uh, which pu sewage pumping stations are going to need to be upgraded. Uh, we've also identified uh, which systems have got uh, storage deficiencies in the water system. Um, some of these may require new, new sites. Um, so we're going to work through the summer uh, to look at site availability um, and maybe some specific ideal locations from these facilities. Um, and then the third one, there's, there's a number of large subdivision blocks that have been identified as, uh, as, as, as you know, expansion areas, uh, urban expansion areas. We don't know at this time exactly what the road patterns are going to look like through those, through those new neighborhoods. We don't know what the servicing plans are going to be specifically for those neighborhoods. So we've gone ahead and we've identified our base assumptions, you know, based on you know review of what what servicing uh, what services are nearby, um, but we're going to, you know, try and uh, you know if there's if there's input on some of those that may come from some of the landowners, we're gonna we're gonna consider that. Um, but those assumptions will will need to be confirmed over time, uh, and 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 that may lead to some some adjustments to the servicing planning here or there. But again, the intent is to get as much of this right as as reasonably as we can based on the information that's available today. Um, the, uh, the design flow and demand basis. So I touched on the conservativeness of design criteria. Um, what we've done as part of this analysis, when we're looking at treatment plant capacity or, or sewer, sewer flows, the best, see a note here, is that a problem? The security. Um, so um, the best the best prediction of what the flows are going to be from the existing service communities tomorrow is what the what the flows were yesterday, right? So you know if the existing communities are generating wastewater flows or consuming water demands that are um, lower than the design criteria, well, we use those. Can I ask that? Out? Of course, we. Yeah. These. Yeah. There it is. Okay. There you go. Hope that's the end of the technical glitches. Um, so we've assumed that the existing service areas are going to use about the same amount of water, you know, on a go forward basis. And similarly for wastewater for new development, it's a bit of an unknown, right? We're anticipating that it's going to be water efficient and all the rest, but we're applying the conservative design standard to the new growth, the, the unknown, if you will. Uh, what that's going to mean is that if upgrades are triggered, the upgrades are more likely going to be a little bit too big versus a little bit too small, right? Um, so that's what we've accounted for there. And uh, in the identification of constraints, um, in the wastewater systems, for example, well, in the water system, we're, we're looking at, you know, projections of the resulting system pressures and available fire flows. But the wastewater systems for the pipes, typically when you build new infrastructure, you build it such that it's not operating at greater than 80% capacity, right? So if you need... 100 liters a second of capacity, you make sure that the pipe's got at least 120 liters a second of capacity. So we're gonna see on some of these maps that we're highlighting sewers in two different colors. Sewers that are highlighted in red are over 100% capacity under their design flow condition. Those need to be upsized. There are others that are gonna be between 80 and 100. So you wouldn't design the sewer to flow at 88% full, but it's at the end of the day, it's not a problem if an existing sewer flows at 88% full. So when we get situations like those, the recommendation more often than not is gonna be for the city to be aware that in some areas, the sewer flows are gonna be greater than 80%. So they're kind of in that range where they're getting close to capacity. 
and maybe put some flow monitoring in those areas so you can keep track of them and see if the flows are increasing to a point where it's becoming a bit of a concern from a capacity perspective. Okay, I've been through a lot. I'm going to take a sip of Port the Lakes water. Okay, sorry about that. But now we're going to see a series of tables and graphs and, and I appreciate for the people in the room it's hard to see it up on the up on the presentation screen but we've got the display panels for those of you at home we're going to go through a series of these and they're all laid out basically the same this is Lindsay water system on the left we've got the the assessment of the treatment facility so we've got a current capacity of 22,730 cubic meters a day we've got um growth projections. So there's a variety of planning horizons, a uh, variety of pri priorities identified P1, P2A, P2B. Those are not in, they're not arbitrary. They're, they're, they're somewhat informed, but it, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a measure of how the planning groups think that growth will occur and where in the, in, in the communities. And there's a bit of a description for those as well. Um, and we're forecasting that as the populations increase, what that's going to mean for the water treatment plant requirements. So that's the table, and it's it's summarized a little more succinctly in the graph. So on the left, the on the y-axis of the graph, um, I don't have a pointer, but um, is the maximum day demand. Uh, the along the bottom of the graph, it's it's not with time. We're not we're not forecasting with time. We're forecasting by population. So as population increases, employment will increase as well. Um, and we're seeing, so the blue line is how we're forecasting that the water treatment requirements are going to increase over time. The horizontal orange line is that current capacity of the Lindsay Water Treatment Plant, that 22,730. The gray line just below it is 80% of that capacity. And typically, you know, the Ministry of Environment likes to see that by the time you hit 80% of your treatment plant capacity, you've got a plan in place for what the upgrade is going to be. Um, so, so that's, that's what we're showing here. So right now we're forecasting the, you know, the treatment plan is running at about 58% capacity and we're seeing that it's going to hit hundred percent capacity when Lindsay grows to a population of about 35,000 people. Um, the 80% threshold will get hit at about 29,000 people. So that just gives a bit of a sense. Now people ask me, well, how long is it going to take it? I don't really know, right? Part of it is, is, is driven by market forces. Um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that we're, you know, we're trying to get a bit of a handle on it. We're trying to forecast the timing. Um, but you know, that, that gives us an indication that, you know, obviously treatment plant upgrades are going to be required. Um, on the top right, we're showing water storage. So water systems need storage. Water plants generally pump out at what's called the maximum day demand. So they satisfy the maximum water demand day in a calendar year. But over the course of a day, in the mornings, you know, when everybody's showering, almost almost everybody showers at the same time, and then in the evenings, people are cooking and they're and they're doing laundry. Those are your two high demand periods during the day. In those instances, the demand in the system, the instantaneous demand in the system, often exceeds the rate at which the treatment plant is pushing water into the system. So in those instances, water comes out of the elevated storage tanks. It's referred to as equalization storage. In the middle of the night, when almost nobody is up and, and is consuming water, the plant continues to push water out at a greater rate than what people are consuming, it, and that fills those water towers back up again. So, so that's the, the top right. And then ultimately, our recommendations for the city of Lindsay, the community of Lindsay, is that we're going to need to upgrade the water treatment capacity. How, where, when is going to be subject to that Schedule C class environmental assessment that is going to be coming it's actually on the, 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 the city is planning for that, that Schedule C Class EA right now. Um, there is going to need to be additional water storage constructed, and there are going to need to be targeted system upgrades uh, and extensions, including uh, a trunk water main servicing the East Lindsay lands. So this is a map of the projected water constraints under peak hour demand. So that's when you've got as much flow as possible running, running through the pipes. That's kind of like your high demand period during the day. So anywhere that's red is any of the red dots are below 40 PSI. And that's generally a requirement. You cannot, you know, you do not want pressures to drop below 40 PSI. The town's objective 
is 50 PSI. So the town strives to try and provide a little bit better than uh, the minimum required. So anywhere that there's an orange dot, it's it's in that 40 to 50 PSI range. Um, so we're certainly seeing in the southwest of Lindsay, um, you know, and there is there are some significant growth parcels out in that area as well. Those lands are also at higher elevation. So when you're at higher elevation, you're closer to the water level that's in those elevated tanks. Um, and the lower you are below that surface, much like whenever you dive down deep into a swimming pool and you feel the extra pressure, there's more pressure with depth. It's the same idea. As you get to higher lands, you're you're at lower pressure. So, um, you know, so we think that you know one of the one of the ways that we can stabilize the pressures out there is to uh, target one of the one of the storage tanks out in that part of town. Um, currently, the the treatment plant is in the south of town. And the pumps, you know, establish a water level, establish a pressure there. You've got a water tower currently on the uh, on the east end of town, which you know helps to stabilize the water pressure out in those areas. So a water tower again across town on the other side would help to provide some stability out there as well. So that's peak hour demand. There's also a fire flow. So we also look at our water systems to be able to provide fire protection for homes and businesses and lives. So what, we, what we're showing here, and the legend, apologies, isn't entirely clear, but what we're showing is the residual fire flow. So different land uses have different firefighting requirements in terms of the volume of water you have to throw on it. Um, residential is lower, you know, commercial is higher, industrial where you could have, you know, chemicals and, and the like, it's, it's much, much higher still. So what we've done is we've modeled the system We've identified what fire flow is required based on adjacent land uses, and we've run the model to show how much residual fire flow, how much fire flow beyond what is required is available there. So anything greater than zero is good, right? Um, anything less than zero means that there's a deficiency. That means that there's not enough fire flow under the, again, this is existing infrastructure with the forecasted growth. So what we're anticipating, again, the elevated storage tank in the east end, uh, will, sorry, in the west end will help with that, but also looping. And, you know, you can see looping up in the up in the northwest out by the airport. We're showing some dashed lines through some of these major development areas. Um, that looping, and if you look at that, that neighborhood right up in the north, you know, we've currently assumed that a lot of that development will connect right there, right? And what that's going to do is that's going to draw a whole lot of water through that neighborhood. But with the looping that we've shown there in dashed lines, connecting those developments together, water is going to be drawn from four or five or, or ultimately maybe 10 different points in the distribution system, which will limit the impact it's going to have on any one existing neighborhood. So uh, so through the looping, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll come up with a solution that, you know, make sure that the, the available fire flows are met. So... These are the types of maps we're going to be showing for the water system. I'm going to go through the other municipalities a little bit quicker. I'm going a little bit slower on this one just so everybody has an understanding of what they're looking at. Again, these slides are going to be available online. You know, if you if you need a little bit more time or want to look at them a little bit more closely, uh, you'll be able to zoom into them a little bit as well. Um, that'll be available to you. On the wastewater side, similar layout to the information as we showed with water. On the left, it's the treatment plant capacity. Same idea. The blue line is how the flows to the wastewater treatment plant are expected to increase. The orange horizontal line is the current capacity, and the gray line is that 80%, you know, when we should be targeting upgrades. It's a very similar, uh, you know, water plants and wastewater plants often have similar capacities because they're basically they're often sized for similar populations. So we're we're seeing you know, similar um, upgrade requirements there. On the top right, instead of water storage facilities, we're looking at sewage pumping stations. So these are sewage pumping stations that are required to service uh, areas of low elevation, you know, down by, you know, lakes or rivers where you need to pump it up into the system where it can flow by gravity the rest of the way there. So we've got, you know, there's, what's that, eight sewage pumping stations in Lindsay. Um, we've got, we're tracking their existing capacity. Uh, and what our anticipated flows are under build out, under dry weather flow conditions and under wet weather flow conditions. And we've got a recommendation either to maintain the facility as it is, upgrade it, or in a couple of cases, review it. Um, so Rivera Park, for example, that current capacity is 637. It was ultimately designed to be upgraded to 701. 
you know, we're seeing under build out wet weather flow 669. Well, it's a little bit above 637, but it's not a whole lot above 637. So what we're going to do with that one is go out and actually test the pumps. Um, sometimes, you know, pumping stations are designed for certain capacity, pumps are supplied, but sometimes depending on the hydraulics of the force mains and the like, you know, maybe they run a little bit higher and they actually can discharge a little bit more. So, uh, you know, we're not going to, you know, just run out and upgrade Rivera Park. No, we're going to have a look at it. We're going to see. And again, some of this is based on design flows, uh, which may be a little bit conservative. So with flow monitoring to track it, you know, it's possible that we can avoid an, you know, a an infrastructure upgrade on paper that maybe isn't required in reality. Uh, Riverview uh, is another one. Um, there's some question as to what the exact capacity of that facility is. So um, there's not a whole lot of growth uh, identified up in that area. It's a facility that by all accounts and purposes is running well today. So there's, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing numbers that, you know, that, that may not jive in terms of the capacity. So we're gonna have a look at that one too uh, and, and possibly refine the recommendation. So ultimately for the Lindsay wastewater system, again, an upgrade in the wastewater treatment plant capacity, uh, again, how or where, that's going to be subject to a Schedule C class environmental assessment. Um, we're got two pumping station upgrades. Sorry, there's three identified in the table, but rid out. Um, we got a little comment there that when we tested it with a lot of the East Lindsay lands being connected that way, um, and you know we'll see on the next couple of slides that well I'll, I'll elaborate that on the next couple of slides, but it says upgrade there, but probably won't be an upgrade. Um, targeted system upgrades and extensions and, and a new East Lindsay trunk sewer. And I'll get into that right now. So the rid out pumping station is roughly in the middle of the screen. There's a little note in the bottom right that kind of shows you where it is. We looked at those East Lindsay lands that are planned for development. And if we connected them straight across to the West into the existing system, there's a whole lot of pipes that go red. Uh, there's pumping stations that go red. We haven't shown, but after the pumping station and the discharge force main, if you upgrade that force main, the, the pumping station will put more flow into some of those sewers, they'll go red. Um, so at this point, we think it's far more feasible that instead of upgrading all this infrastructure, existing infrastructure and existing streets that was never designed to service these lands because these lands weren't you know, part of the settlement boundary, it's, it's likely gonna be far more efficient to build a separate trunk sewer, take it up to a point um, you know, as close to the treatment plan as it needs to be, without triggering unnecessary upgrades of the of the trunks that are going into the plant in the north end of town. So that's an example. So you see how we've shown some of those red block arrows uh, taking those flows to the to the to the west, but we've put some red X's on it because it, that doesn't it doesn't make sense. It's 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 not it's not likely what we're going to be recommending. We're likely going to be recommending a separate trunk sewer to service the entirety of those of those East Lindsay lands uh, rather than you know triggering all kinds of upgrades to existing infrastructure. Uh, there's some other areas in the southwest of town. Uh, you know, you can see a, a run of red sewers and there's a couple of disjointed sections as it flows east and north. You know, that's that's essentially a continuous path of sorts. Uh, and, you know, there's some development pressures down there that are triggering those upgrades. So that's, you know, not not super surprising. Um, but that's so those are the upgrades. And this is under dry weather flow conditions. That DWF is dry weather flows. So that's where we want the pipes to be flowing with excess capacity, airspace in the tops of the pipes. I'm gonna to go to the wet weather flows. Here we're looking, we're again, as I described earlier, we accept the fact that the pipes are gonna be flooded. The pipes are gonna be surcharged. We just wanna make sure they're not surcharged to the point that the water levels get so high that they have the potential to impact people's basements. Uh, on this slide, you'll see the freeboard uh, in, the, in the legend. Red is flooded to surface. Orange is it's somewhere between surface and 1.8 meters below grade. So those are the, the red is really bad. It could flood, it could flood to the streets, which we really don't want. Uh, the orange, uh, we really don't want that either because that can impact on people's basements. So, uh, and you'll see that a lot of those clusters of red and orange nodes are along similar alignments to the previous slide uh, that I'll go back to where the pipes didn't have enough capacity for the dry weather flows. So there is, there is a correlation there. So when we solve the problem for the dry weather flows, we're likely going to be solving the problem for the wet weather flows as well. And when we run the analysis with you know recommended pipe upgrades and we run our, our computer simulations again, it will it will show that, or we'll go up one more pipe size and we'll run it again. 
So take another quick little break here. Um, so that that was basically Lindsay. The next six slides are going to show basically the same information for Bob Cajun, same the same type of analysis, and then we're going to get into Fennel and Falls, and then Omimi and Woodville. So I'm going to go much faster through these. Um, you know, people here in the room, if you got specific questions about these municipalities, we can talk about them afterwards. People at home, if you've got specific questions, you can send them through as well. But you know, Bob Cajun, very similar story. Uh, on the water system, we're going to need more treatment plant capacity. We're going to need a little bit more water storage. We're forecasting that the we're only going to reach 123% of the existing storage capacity. So it's going to be a small storage expansion. In Lindsay, we were forecasting we were going to be at 250% of the storage capacity. So we're going to have to build two and a half times the existing storage uh, and system upgrades and extensions as well. Uh, here in the water system, we've shown these blue lines, heavy blue lines. Those are areas where we're anticipating some upgrades to alleviate some of the pressure challenges. Uh, and, and similarly here is the, the max A plus fire. Uh, and, and you can see where those constraint areas are a little bit more clearly on this one. And those blue pipe increases, as well as the looping, those dashed lines that are we're not sure exactly where they're going to be, but we're going to make sure that when those developments proceed, that they connect from one street all the way around through the development, connect to another street to provide some benefit to the surrounding areas as well. Wastewater, again, um, you know, treatment capacity increase. Uh, we've got four sewage pumping stations in Bob Cajun that look like they're going to need upgrades. Um, and then some targeted system upgrades and, ex and extensions. Um, and they're here, the, the pumping stations, I didn't clarify earlier, but the, those are the triangles. And the ones that are green are generally going to be have sufficient capacity for the growth. The ones that are red do not. Um, so that's what we've got for Bob Cajun under dry weather flows and under wet weather flows. The risk of flooding is not quite as prevalent in Bob Cajun, which is good. But, you know, there are there is a cluster uh, over there in the east. Um, again, you're, you know, very low elevation, very close to lake. But, we'll you know, we'll make sure that the, the systems are adequately sized. Um, Fenelon Falls, uh, smaller municipality. Um, Fenelon Falls, based on this current growth forecast, um, the Fenelon Falls water plant does have enough capacity. Now, uh, a note on Fenelon Falls. Um, we are, let's bump ahead. Um, so there's, there's a development, that I guess it was formerly known as Fenelon Trails. There's a new owner for it now. Um, this is a uh, development that's proposed. It's it's a development area that's been identified. It was previously identified as being about 360 or 365 units. Uh, there have been there's been an application. There have been public meetings, one by the developer, another by uh, involving the involving the city as well. Uh, that's considering a higher density for those lands. Um, it has not been approved yet, but it's being contemplated. So. Uh, you know, until the growth management strategy is finalized, we're not entirely sure what it's going to end up being, but we're we're currently tracking both alternatives. So with with the increased number of units, um, it, it it could end up uh, resulting in, in triggering a water treatment plant capacity increase as well. Um, we are seeing uh, storage upgrades required under under both of those development scenarios, um, as well as um, some uh, some system expansions. But the, the treatment capacity upgrade is only identified under the higher density scenario. Um, there are the water, the water constraint areas, um, you know, most of which will be solved by looping. Uh, there are a couple of water pipe upgrades identified in the in the north end of town there. Uh, and then the max day plus fire. Uh, so and the and the development areas on all these not all of the maps actually have that layer turned on, unfortunately, but the, the development areas are typically shown in those shaded colors. So here, all the developments that are shaded in blue, those are the, the major growth areas that we're anticipating in Fenland Falls. Uh, from a wastewater perspective, again, the plan information, uh, three pumping stations in town. The three pumping stations are all located downstream well, or, or the growth is all located upstream of these sewage pumping stations. So with the increased populations, there will be increased flows to those stations. Uh, and there will be a need to upgrade those stations as well. So 
Uh, so Fenelon Falls, it's a treatment plant upgrade, three pumping stations, and some pipe upgrades. This, these are the numbers again with the increased density. Uh, even with the, you know, the originally proposed density, it was going to trigger a treatment plant upgrade. So in this case, the treatment plant upgrade will be a little bit larger. Um, overall, the the sewers themselves uh, within Federal and Falls appear to have sufficient capacity. Um, it's the pumping stations really that uh, that are the uh, the the pinch points in the system. Um, and obviously, you know, there will need to be some new sewers extended into those new neighborhoods on on the new roads. Okay, Omimi. So Omimi is serviced primarily. Well, the entire town is serviced by wastewater. Almost the entire town. Uh, there's a very small percentage of Omimi, a very small neighborhood that's that's serviced by water. So we're focusing strictly on wastewater for Omimi. Um, the again, it's the, the plant upgrades, uh, pumping station upgrades, and then some targeted system upgrades as well. Um, there's the map it shows the pumping station, and it shows the those block arrows. I guess maybe I didn't reiterate it maybe clearly enough, but those block arrows are our assumptions of where those development blocks are going to get serviced. Um, you know, sometimes it's obvious when they're immediately adjacent to existing pipes. Um, in other cases, it's not. Um, so, you know, we've had to, you know, we've looked a little bit at the topography to get a sense as to which way the land falls. In some cases, there are servicing plans and, and draft plans of subdivision that have been submitted for some of these parcels. So we have a little bit more knowledge of those based on the developers and the developers engineers actually looking at, at those specifics. Um, and that's uh, under wet weather flows. Again, not a whole lot of, uh, of flooding concerns in Omimi. Uh, and then Woodville. So Woodville is only serviced by municipal water. Um, the build out of the population forecast will exceed the treatment plant capacity by about 10%. Um, the storage in Woodville is, is more is sufficient. You know, we're, we're not going to be using more than uh, about 54% of the currently installed storage. Um, and there is where the low pressures are forecasted to be at peak hour. Where we're seeing the red nodes in Woodville, there's there's a fair bit of topography range in Woodville, and there are some significant hills out there. Um, the the standpipe, which is that, that cyan-colored hexagon in the middle that's basically built at high ground. Um, so you're going to have slightly lower pressures there than you will in the rest of the community. Uh, again, looping should help alleviate um, some of those pressure concerns along the main street, uh, the main east-west street through Woodville. Um, and actually this slide, the Woodville system actually is not sized for fire protection. So um, this, this slide actually isn't particularly relevant. So, um, sorry, the small systems, uh, we've got more work that we need to do on that yet. So, um, so the next steps, uh, and on the small systems, we're not ignoring them. We've just, we focus on the pipe hydraulics uh, in the main urban communities, uh, predominantly to get this information out to you, to get people talking about it. Um, in, the, in the smaller systems, uh, we did present some forecasts um, at the first public information center um, and a bit of a sense as to how much growth um, we think that those treatment facilities may be able to accommodate um, those numbers are going to have to get refined a little bit because with really, really small systems, um, you've, you've, they're designed differently. So some of the metrics that we used initially uh, were perhaps not appropriate. There's also in the smaller systems, not all growth. The, the smaller systems in some of those communities don't even service the entire community. They service specific neighborhoods because there was a specific need in some of them. Um, so they're, those smaller systems of those hamlets, this, the, the town's servicing, the city's servicing policies for those hamlets doesn't require municipal water and sewer like they do Lindsay, Fenelon Falls, Bob Cajun, Omimi. Um, you're allowed to develop on wells and septic systems out there. So uh, the, the, the inclusion of water distribution systems is typically done on a case by case basis. Um, there, there may be applications to connect to some of those existing water, water networks. There may not be. So those, those will be addressed more on a case by case basis. Um, so anyway, where does that leave us? Um, so we're, 
moving ahead, we're going to be refining some of these analyses. We're going to be, um, you know, coming up with a with a detailed list of of more specific recommendations. This street from here to there, that street from there to there. Um, but before we get too far into that, we we do want to hear from you. Um, if you've got specific concerns about your street, your community, again, concerns about water or wastewater, we do have to keep it uh, topical uh, to the study. Um, so we would request that, you know, you get those comments into us in the next month. We've said by the end of July, just it's an easy date for people to remember. Um, we're going to continue to refine our models as required. The, the GMS process, the growth management strategy process is not yet complete. It is nearing completion. Um, as those numbers get finalized, we'll push those last updates into our models and we're going to refine some of the, some of the numbers. We're going to refine, uh, you know, some of what we've shown you today. It's mostly correct. Um, it's not absolutely correct. There are going to be a few changes, you know, in the, in the GMS, we'll incorporate those. It's not going to cause massive changes. I wouldn't expect, um, but we'll be, we'll be sharing that information publicly as well once it's finalized. Uh, and then ultimately there's going to be a review of the phasing. People are always asking, a lot of people asked yesterday, we were in Fennelin Falls yesterday doing the same presentation. And a lot of people were asking, well, well, when's that, when's that development going to go in? When's that water main going to extend it? When's that sewer going to get extended? Because I have a property that's over there, you know, I'm not a developer, but geez, it sure would be nice if that sewer came by, then eh, maybe I could be a developer. So those numbers, we're going to look to refine those a little bit over the summer. Um, again, you know, the planning department can can dictate to a certain extent, you know, where and how growth occurs, especially, you know, for example, say there's a community that for full build out needs sewer upgrades in the east and sewer upgrades in the west. There's not necessarily a need to build both of those sewer upgrades at the same time. You can focus on one sewer upgrade in one part of town and unlock a lot of development over there. More than enough units are going to be required to support, you know, the development over the first 10 years. And then 10 years later, you build this, you know, the sewer upgrades on the other end of town and then unlock the development on that side of town, right? You know, if you, you know, there's, it's not, it doesn't make financial sense in some cases, you know, to build the two sewers at the same time. Not only that, it's, it takes time to build sewers, right? It's, you know, it requires construction crews and, you know, and it, and it closes down streets and it impacts residents. So we're going to work through. So we're looking for like all of these plans are based on what's needed for the full build out. Then we're going to roll it back and say, okay, what's needed in the next five years? What's needed in the next 10 years, 15 years, that sort of thing. And then we're going to finalize the, the master plan. And it's going to be a document that's going to be public facing. It's going to be publicly available for all of you at home, all of you in the room, all of your friends and neighbors to have a look at uh, and provide comment on. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it, like I said, it's, there's going to be a 30 day statutory public review. We're targeting um, sometime in the fall. I think that's that's all we had. So uh, so thank you for attending. A um, couple of closing remarks first. Uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand in the room or raise your hand online. We, do we have a couple coming in, Martin? We have one already. We have one already. Excellent. You know what? We're going to start. We're going to start there. Um, in a minute. Um, comment forms. Uh, there are there are comment forms available here on the way out. Uh, you can take those and you can you can complete them. Let us know if you've got any concerns. What you like. You know, we'll take positive comments as well. It's, those are always appreciated. Um, future updates are going to be made available on the website. You go to courtthelakes.ca slash major projects. Scroll down the list. There's all the individual communities down at the bottom. There's citywide. You click on that and expand the list. So you'll see water, wastewater, infrastructure, master plan. Uh, the information's there. Um, please do add your name to the contact list. Um, it makes it easier for us to reach out to you. Uh, my name and contact information is on the right. Nafir's is also on the right, just immediately above mine. You can reach out reach out to either one of us. It's all right. Um, so with that, we're going to get the questions. Actually, before we do, um, like I said, we did this last night, right? So you are all going to benefit from some of the questions that were asked of us last night. One of the questions that I love from last night was, where does the water in the towers come from, right? And it's a lot of people, you know, they turn on their taps, the water comes out. They don't think a whole lot about it until it doesn't work. Um, so, you know, it's, it's treated water from the treatment plants. And as I described earlier, in periods of high demand, water drains out of those tanks to supplement what the plant is pushing out. In periods of low demand, the reverse happens. Uh, another question is, why are we, why is the city developing so much land? Now, this, 
this is one of those closed doors, but I understand that a lot of people are curious. A lot of people are sometimes anxious about change. Um, so this is, this is a planning issue. Um, and basically when lands are zoned for development, you know, through the, the, the city's growth management strategy, um, there are some other lands that were provincially designated for growth. Um, when those lands are zoned, the city has a responsibility to plan for servicing of those lands. That's, that's, that's the simple reality. Um, so again, the objective of this study is to determine what's needed to service those lands. Um, there was a question last night about, you know, why are we discharging wastewater into our water supply? That's it's a fair question. You've got lakes, which is where the effluent from the wastewater treatment plant goes, but it's also the source of water for the water treatment. Plant. Um, it's, it's very, very common. Um, almost every city that, that draws water from, from a water body um, discharges the wastewater to the same water body. The, the important thing, obviously, is that, you know, we treat the wastewater to Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks requirements that ensure that we're not uh, returning too many nutrients, too much phosphorus, too many nitrates. Um, you know, so we're, we're discharging at acceptable levels. And then the water on its way in, you know, we, we remove whatever else we need to um, prior to putting it through the distribution. Um, there was also a question about, um, there were some comments about bypasses at the Lindsay and the Fenelon Falls wastewater plants and a, a legitimate question about, you know, why are we growing when we're bypassing those plants? And I just want to take a minute to clarify bypassing. Bypassing means different things from a regulatory perspective than it might mean to the lay person in the room. Um, in Lindsay, during high wet weather flows, there are sometimes bypasses that occur, by which point the flows that are coming to the treatment plant bypass the plant and go into a series of equalization storage lagoons. The Lindsay system historically was a lagoon-based treatment system. When the treatment plant, when the existing treatment plant was built, those lagoons were stayed there and they act as equalization tanks, if you will. So in periods where the flows coming into the plant are greater than what the plant can process, they divert the excess, largely diluted because it's stormwater. Well, it's, 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 it's a mixture of stormwater and wastewater, but it diverts those into the lagoons. And when the flows to the plant subside, the city then drains those lagoons back to the treatment plant and, and treats that bypassed water that was captured and treats it before releasing it to the environment. So it receives full treatment. Um, in Fenelon Falls, there's a, it's a tertiary treatment plant. So there's three stages of treatment. The third stage is a filtration system. And sometimes when you're processing large flows through a filtration system through an extended period of time, those filters can clog up a little bit as they remove some of the particulate matter before you discharge it. Um, and as those filters clog, um, it, it, it restricts the amount of flow that you can push through them, the amount of water you can push through them on an instantaneous basis. So sometimes, you know, those that the, the tertiary filters do get bypassed, but that effluent has still received two stages of treatment before that point. And the effluent, even bypassing the tertiary filters, still is below the limits of what the of the, the nutrient limits that you're that you're allowed to discharge at. So Really, what it means is that you know if that if that tertiary if those tertiary filters weren't there, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a, a, a process to bypass. It wouldn't get flagged, and the town would still be compliant. The tertiary filters are there to provide an enhanced level of treatment. Uh, when they do get bypassed, you know the required level of treatment is still provided. So, um, but and all that said, as we increase the the the, the service population in these communities we are going to have to look at increasing the treatment plant capacities as well. So um, I just want to make sure that, you know, people understand the word, the word bypass doesn't mean what you think it means necessarily all the time. Okay, there we go. I'm going to go, actually, I'm going to go back to the really beginning. Um, and I'm going to put that QR code back up there um, for those that are at home and maybe want to, uh, to scan it and get signed up. I should have added it to the last slide next time. Um, but what's our question, Mark? Hello, Kevin. Can you please remind us what does ADF in the tables mean? Oh, ADF. Oh, you know what? I was trying, I was trying real hard with the acronyms. ADF is average day flow. Um, so, and ADF is 
what we refer to um, in wastewater plants. Um, you know, you've got a, oops, sorry, trying to do two things at once. Um, average day flow is, you know, what the plant is designed for. Um, there's also a hand up, I see. You've got that one too? Uh, okay. So, uh, Ryan, uh, if you've got a question, please type it into the uh, Q&A. Um, treatment plants have got an average day capacity as well as a max or a peak flow capacity. Um, so that's, that's the difference between ADF, uh, average day flow. Um, I touched on WWF, wet weather flow, DWF, dry weather flow, GMS, growth management strategy. Are there, are there many other acronyms? If there are, please let me know and I'll, I'll expand. Uh, any any questions in the room while we wait for Ryan possibly to uh, to submit? None. Yes, one. I have a question. Um, a lot of things in Lindsay that have been overlooked over the years. We got a situation where the town of Lindsay has a DCB pump that's eight to eight to a mile away from the town. Like it was the munitions dump. During the war, there's 30 acres of PCBs in that area. Now okay. we had a group going here, uh, exposing some things in within the town of Lindsay. We did water samples of the town of Lindsay and we found PCBs in the water course and in the water source that people were drinking. So this is a concern on my part. The city of Quaff Lakes as the Ontario Water Agency, from the Water Agency, do all this work. And they're only responsible for bacteria. Okay, this is the reason why Doug Ford has made it so that all these testing facilities are closed down. So the people actually don't really know what they're drinking. Okay. So this is a serious thing in the future. This PCB dump, okay, is contained but not contained because one day it's going to open up and it's going to pollute the water source for instance. And there's nothing been looked at here. The province has never ever put any money towards this to clean this PCB dump up. It's something that is a serious problem for the future of Lindsay. All right. Um I'm not aware of I'm not aware of the PCB dump. It's, well, it's out there. Okay. And I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying that I'm not aware of it. Um, I'm also not aware of there having been any water quality concerns through the treatment plants. We have water treatment uh, uh, papers. We had some uh, uh, water tests done, and there was PCBs in the water. Well, I assure you that you know the the water system that comes out of the out of the water treatment plant, the water is tested regularly, and there are annual reports to the Ministry of Environment on an annual basis. So. Um, you know, I'm not aware of of any instances where there have been any um what am I looking for? Any any failures of the of the water treatment plants. So never been locked in. Well, I assure you, if it was a risk to public health, if if, if there were contaminants in the drinking water system that were a risk to public health, I would expect they would be they would be looked at. Yeah, I would I would think so. But in, in the future, what's going on here with our our facilities being closed down so that people actually can't get water treatment? Okay, or water treatment samples in and have them looked at. I, this all going? I, I, well, I can't speculate to a future of of a PC, a potential PCB issue that there's no evidence that it's that it's affecting the drinking water system today. It, it was put there during the war. Well, I, okay, uh, that's fine, and there's no indication that there's PCBs in the treated water system. You know, if if oh, if the, is it is it treated water or is it or is it private wells? And it's, it's water, it's in the water course. Okay, so oh. all these tributaries and aquifers underneath that area are all, all exposed to this. So okay, they've never ever looked at properly, they should have dumped. Now, I'm sorry, but this is something that should be looked at and addressed before any kind of development or any kind of water source can be looked at. All I can say is that the treated, the effluent from the water treatment plants comply with Ontario Ministry of Environment regulations. It does. It's only on the basis, when you take a look at what the Clean Water Agency works on, it's only on bacteria. 
I checked all the legislation. All right. Well, then, all right, we'll we'll take that conversation offline then, uh, and we'll you know if there's if there's merit to it, then there is merit to it. It's a it's a physical right. thing that has been in. Thank you, thank you. We have a situation here where the, the town of Lens actually was going to use it as the tourist thing where they could walk through the town of Okay, I'm so I'm I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you there. For the interest of people that are on, that are you know taking their time at home, they're here in this room. That is outside of the scope of this study. If you've got specific concerns, we'll direct it to some city staff and we'll talk about it. Yeah. But it's not, it's nothing. That, I'm sorry that it's nothing that this study can address. All right. So thank you. Sorry. Anything else? There was Ryan that was talking. Yes, I do have a question. I'll two questions here. I'll go with Ryan first. Okay. Um, for clarity, did you run models assuming the units proposed in the Fenelon Trails application? That's us. Yeah, we 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 touched on that. Um, I touched on that in the in the presentation. We we did run an analysis based on the original forecasted number of units for that particular subdivision, uh, somewhere in the order of three hundred and twenty five units. Um, there has been an application for just under 900 units, I believe, um, you know, and it, it, it changes the results of the analysis somewhat, um, you know, uh, and, you know, I understand that that, um, that approval process is ongoing and we anticipate that it'll get um, fully resolved, I guess, through the GMS process. Resolve may not be the appropriate word, but um, for intents and purposes, we're anticipating that we're going to get further direction from the GMS and we'll update our analysis accordingly. If that addressed your uh, your question, uh, please just say, "Hey, great, thanks." It's so well, just so that I know that <laughs> we got we got one way communication here. It's it's hard. Uh, there's another question in the tables where there are planning horizon assumptions, for example, P1, P2, P3, with detailed breakdown on those specific calculations of expected development. Will detailed breakdown? on those calculations of expected developments be shared in the final report? Uh, probably in about the same level that it's being shown here. Um, you know, we've been given some input from town planning staff as to roughly when they believe certain development applications are gonna proceed. Uh, some of that is based on, you know, there's a development application under work in, in the way already. Well, that's probably a P1. Uh, they know that a developer is working on starting to prepare a development application. M maybe that's P2. I, I don't have you know detailed specifics on it. Um, realistically, what this is, is just a, it's to give us a sense as to um, roughly how much development can happen when. And again, there aren't, dates assigned to those specifically. We're not saying that, you know, something in P2A can't go ahead until all of P1 is done. It's it's just to give us a little bit of a, a breakdown or a little bit of an idea as to uh, growth over time. He says, thanks, appreciate it. Oh, see, very nice. Well, I appreciate the question too. Ah, we got the uh, one in the back here. Yeah, a similar question to Ryan's. There was that table that was every year of compensation. Yes. The figure had a big block there with an X in it. Yes. Um, in the table, I'm just curious if you had something, it was an under review of the year. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Did that include some of the Eastlands? Um, Rivera, uh, look at here. Um, I'm not going to answer that one right now because I don't have, sorry, the question was, um, so we're showing Rivera Park sewage pumping station, which is pretty much right in the middle of the map here. In the table, we've shown Rivera Park as review, possibly needing an upgrade. The question was, um, were some of those East Lindsay lands uh, assumed to be connecting 
um, two sewers that are ultimately draining to Rivera Park SPS. Um, so, you know, is there capacity for some of those East Lindsay lands through Rivera Park? Uh, is there a limit to Rivera Park that, you know, um, I don't know offhand. Um, I didn't do all the modeling. We can, I would rather than, rather than give you an incorrect answer now, I would rather give you a correct answer in a week. Right. So, so Carl, if you, if you could. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're gonna have to dig into that a little bit more. Um, but uh, but by all means, you know, send us send us your question, and we'll we'll do what we can to address it. Anything else? Back back to back. All right. <laughs> Deciding to use the state criteria for water for future growth. Correct. Both on the demand side and on the flow side. Was there debate on this? All of it typically done in, in master plans to all of these conservative rate versus the, the one that's historically. It is typically done in master plans. Um, you know, we, oh, sorry, I got to repeat the question. Uh, the question was uh, we assigned the design criteria, water use, and sewer generation. Uh, uh, assumption of 450 liters per person per day um, to all of the new growth. Um, and, you know, is that the standard practice? From a master planning perspective, yes. From a sewer design and construction perspective, yes. You know, if you're proposing a new sewer down the road, oh, I see a hand at the back that may want to clarify some. So I, I think just for the purpose of the audience and the question, it is also based on the 2.2 persons per unit right. criteria. Yeah. So it is a product of those two. Right. right. And actually, and that's that's an excellent point as well. Um, 450 liters per capita is a high per capita design allowance. 2.3 persons per unit is also a very low um, unit density as well. Um, I'm going to get off my soapbox here in a minute. I often find it. And interesting that we we combine two assumptions when we do a servicing analysis. We assume the number of people per unit, and then we go and assume the number of liters that each of those people are going to use. We couldn't simplify our lives by just saying a unit requires. So instead of 450 liters per person times 2.3 person per, we could just say 1,200 liters per unit per day. Um, but anyway, it. We've been doing it this way forever, and it shall it shall be ever thus. <laughs> Another great question. Thank you. It's nice to have other water professionals in the room. Keep me on my toes. Anything else, Martin? No. Answer to the question. I did it. Did I answer? I thought I answered the question. Great answer. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> the acknowledgement of the answer. Um, on that, though, um, we do know that in many areas of Cortho Lakes, there is a higher than design value infiltration flow, right? We we typically design the design allowance for extraneous flows is 0.26 liters per hectare per second. We often see that that's exceeded. Uh, for future growth areas, we have used the 0.26 number. Uh, we're anticipating that those sewer systems, a lot of times we're starting to get further away from the water courses. We're getting a higher elevation. Those sewers are maybe coming up out of the groundwater. Um, and also with the advances in uh, in, in, in pipe construction, uh, you know, with the plastic pipes, a little bit of flexibility, some, you know, better joints. Uh, those systems do tend to be more watertight. So we're, we're, we're you know, we're, we're sticking with the, with the design criteria on the per capita flows, but also on the extraneous flows. So there's a little bit of give and take. Okay. Oh, there's a finger up. When do you see this type of study being refreshed in five or ten years? So these types of studies tend to get refreshed. I'm not going to repeat the question because the answer is <laughs> repeats the question. I was ready though. Uh, they typically get refreshed every five years. Um, the official plans get updated every five years. These infrastructure studies get, you know, every five years, uh, typically. Thank you for the answer. I appreciate your question. Well. <laughs>
we can stop doing this now. <laughs> All right, well, on that note, uh, there are no more questions coming in. Questions, you can continue to submit questions, those of you at home. Uh, those of you in the room, pick up a comment form, submit questions. Uh, I will thank you all for attending. Uh, have a great night. Thank you.